rise and shine value farm family how are you all doing you're most welcome to value farm of course if you're new here you are most welcome please consider subscribing and also turn your notification bells not to miss out on any videos on this channel and of course to all our returning subscribers you guys are gems we really appreciate you guys so much for coming back to watch and also supporting value farm and also being part of the journey of what we are doing here exactly so today is a beautiful morning yeah we came here very early in the morning it is very bright everything looks amazing we started by feeding the animals it has just been an amazing morning today and of course this brought us to the topic of the day that we are going to talk about integrated farming or what most people call as mixed farming is it reasonable is it lucrative is it profitable how can you start a mixed farm and how can you start it from the beginnings that is what we are going to be talking about today and of course i have my co-director on standby who is also going to help us and also educate us more and also tell us what his experience has been in mixed farming or integrated farming so that we can also have a view and also have your thoughts about this topic of the day because we all want to benefit as a farmer in case you're just starting in case you're just thinking about starting a mixed farm what should you put into consideration that's what we are going to talk about today so let's start the topic hi gregory how are okay. you doing i'm actually doing pretty well thank you very much for that lovely introduction hello value Fund family and thank you for joining us today um, it's a very interesting topic but before i begin mm. i want to send a special hello to some of our friends in the caribbean oh. we understand we actually have an audience that's actually in yes. espanola and so for, for those of you out there, <laughs> surprise, tout haïtien, qui fanatique Chanel ça, bienvenue, bien apprécié parce que moi nous aime programme na fait là. Continuez à regarder et puis voyez information ça par l'autre ami, par l'autre famille parce que you know, moi haïtien mieux tout. Est-ce que nous comprenons? So, moi là, moi juste en Afrique, moi pense faire un bar pour tout haïtien, pour tout africain qui n'est pas de côté nier pour qu'il vienne là. Pour une jeune idée, ça n'a fait là. Pour nous, juste mettre là en pratique. Vous comprenez? So, welcome. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I got this for a moment. So, <laughs> so I'm. What did you say? <laughs> no, essentially, what I said to all of our brethren out there in the Caribbean, wherever you are, whether you're in Haiti, whether you're in Jamaica, or wherever. But this was specific for the people from Hispaniola. Okay. Essentially, letting them know like we're here. We're on one team, whether you're in Africa, here on the continent, here specifically in Uganda, or in the Caribbean. What we're doing here is try to educate and inspire people from all over the place. And if they can learn something or pick something from what we're doing here, you know, then the journey is worth it. So thank you guys wow. for joining us. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> that is good encouragement. Our farmers here. So let me just share this with you guys. The why integrated farming? Why is it important? Yeah. Why is it important? So. The reason for me, I mean, and I'm, why did we even start an integrated farm? Maybe? The reason I wanted to start an integrated farm with you, mm -hmm. apart from you being on the ground and being like very, very close to the action. Yes. When it comes to integrated farming, we all have heard the, the same from our grandmothers or our mothers or the wise elders. Mm -hmm. Never put all your eggs in one in basket. One basket. <laughs> yes. It's a simple philosophy, but it also applies to farming as it applies to life. Right. I mean, some people just want to grow crops, which is fine. And some people like my neighbor here is predominantly growing just maize. Yes, maize yes. Now, what happens even with maize, you know, if the rains don't come and you don't have proper irrigation, you literally your entire crop for that season could be lost. Yeah, right. True. So how do you hedge your losses? How do you ensure on some of your victories is the most important thing. So if that person were to plant maize, sweet potatoes or even some soy, if one crop doesn't do well, either based on irrigation, lack of water, or any specific disease that might be attacking the crops for that season, mm -hmm. you spread your risk out. That way, if, some, if the worst happens, yep. you have a backup plan. Wow. That's, so. that's how it is. <laughs> and that's what we've been inspiring people out there. When they see what is on the ground, yeah. they feel we're doing something amazing. And we've inspired people, people who are doing only poultry, mm -hmm. to also start piggery. In most cases, that's what I've realized people really get inspired by Value Farm. Yeah. Mm. So in terms of another reason I actually wanted to point out that's extremely important. Yes. So guys, think of it from this standpoint, right? Mm. I don't know if any of you have ever 
um, started any other business before this? Or have you, if you considered um, getting into the free as an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. Most businesses, right, or business owners or people who actually think of starting a company, mm -hmm. typically it's their third or fourth business yes. att attempt at it that tends to succeed. Why is that? We make mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those of us who are wise enough, when you make a mistake, it makes you better. You know, learn from it. you learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So part of integrated farming, you might come into farming thinking you want to grow watermelons or you mm -hmm. might come into farming thinking you want to grow spices or onions or whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. But then you might discover the type of soil you have you is better suited for what? For pineapple True. or for sugar cane mm -hmm. or for sugar peas. You're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. So how do you mitigate those losses? Like, let me give you guys an example here. What we did when we decided to do this farm, yeah. here in Uganda, we wanted to do more what? Ducks, ducks rabbits, mm. goats was the primary things we wanted yeah, to do. But then as we got into it, we realized, wait a minute, we're in the country that eats more pork than any other country yeah, on the country continent. Yeah. Why are we not catering to the market? That's how the pigs came into the fray, right? Sure. And since that time, the response has been overwhelmingly positive so, and our piggery unit which was an afterthought initially, is now at the forefront of what we do here at Value Farm, right? Yes. Actually, what really happened, I remember we had already bought this land, uh -huh. and by the time we were going to buy the ducks, we had gone to buy the geese and yes. the ducks. <laughs> then in the process of looking at the farmer that we had gone to get these items, yeah. the, the, the pigs were really amazing. That's when we decided to start the pig farm. True story. Now, everything starts with research, right? Yeah. So, you know, in fact, if you can pan here behind on the fence here on this side, um, IQ, you'll see the, what we decided to do with the actual fence, mm -hmm. right? We initially, when we started to actually fence this property, we actually ended up using eucalyptus mm -hmm. poles, right? Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, we realized where we are, even though these poles are treated, we have termites, right? Yes. So it's, no matter how often we treat, no matter what we do, mm. that risk exists. Mm. So what did we do? We actually decided to hedge our bet by introducing these specific plants, right? Yeah. Now these plants at some point, as long as we make sure that we keep the goats off of them, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're gonna keep growing and they'll get to a point where these poles actually start to you know, fade and wither. Their, their replacement is already in the ground. Why did I choose that as an example? It's the same thing. So like for here, when we started again, it was predominantly ducks, and rabbits, and everything and else. Poultry. And poultry was always a part yes. of the plan. Yes. But now, as we're expanding, we came into this more on the ground with the pigs in place, right? Yeah. But then when we got cattle on the farm, yeah. was to essentially get what for the animals, right? Get to use the milk, the milk. to help yeah. us wean the piglets faster. Now, the byproduct of having cattle, if you pan to the back, is the added manure, which is organic fertilizer for the crops, for the crops right? Yeah. So that then rolled into us using the added resources we've gathered from the cattle, which yeah. is the byproduct. It's nothing we actually ever thought about, really, initially. Yeah. That wasn't the focus. But now we're gonna take you guys to another section where we're actually testing the testing soil, the soils. where we're actually planting different um, vegetables, grass. different grass to see what's gonna work well in this area. Mm -hmm. And based on the research and how that actually f come to fruition, mm -hmm. we'll make an educated decision exactly. on how to move forward with that part of the business, right? Yes. So yeah, we'll take you guys to the other side. And majorly, these are just pilot kind of things. We're just trying to test them out. To Absolutely. See they work. Yeah. If they don't work, we we'll switch. We we'll do something else. That's why everyone who's doing an integrated farm should be open minded. 100%. Yes. Do not be stuck on one thing and you feel like, okay, this is what I thought in the beginning. This is what I've researched about and I'm sticking to it. Please be open minded. Try something else and also try to listen to other people and also copy from other farmers, of course, what they are doing so that you can also try. Give it a try. You never know that will be your success story at the end of it all. I agree with you 100 percent because you know what? At the end of the day, you know, we live in a society where people just tend to follow the leader. Uh -huh. <laughs> and who's to say the leader 
is not somebody who's actually watching this, vi this video right now. You could be the person in your area to decide to pick a specific type of farming that nobody thought about, right? Sure. So be open-minded, be ready to just shift on a dime mm -hmm. because as farmers, you can't be rigid. You always have to adapt to the seasons, to the weather, you know, to your soil condition, whatever comes your way, we get knocked down. But the most important thing, you got to get back up. No crying over spilled milk and you just move forward. Mm -hmm. Guys, here's something else, right? Mm -hmm. So as a team, as you guys know, you guys know what we do here at Value Farm because you guys watch and we appreciate and love the fact that you do. Yes. Now, when we started this farm and some of the other updated videos, you guys have seen what we have here. Yeah. We have everything from goose to enkofus, ducks. ducks. We have chicken. We have some of the local the chickens. Local chicken, yeah. And then now another animal we added because we got the cattle were the sheeps, right? Yes. Now, initially, we started out with just a few, and we just wanted companions for the sheep, for, for, the, for the actual cattle, right? Mm. What we've discovered since we've had the sheeps on the farm, the growth rate is so much faster than the goats. That is so true. They are very disease res resistant. I've and never seen like, the time we've treated this. We have, we've never dewormed any of our sheep, which is incredible. And the amount of care they take is minimal. So now, myself, I love goat meat. This is just as much as the next Ugandan or anybody else out there, right? Mm. But I also have a real love for lamb. And being from the US, lamb meat is so expensive. Wow. It's a luxury yeah. meat, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's not. Literally, <laughs> I, I think you just don't know. I'm telling you. Mm. But here's the thing. For those of you who are abroad and you know exactly what I'm talking, whether you're in the UK or the US, mm -hmm. to get a rack of lamb, right? They can go anywhere between $75 up to $100 based on the type of meat. I mean, the type of specific lamb, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, I like lamb. I started researching and we actually like having them on the farm because they're so low maintenance. Mm -hmm. So now this is something we never considered doing Right. And we're finding out, you know what? Easy to maintain, easy to manage. The growth rate is faster. In fact, you can get a lamb to market within four and a half months. The average ghost will take you five and a half to six months, in some cases, seven months before you can start selling. Right. Yeah. So now our region, there's no major player that has a control of the market share that with lambs. So right. So it got us thinking. We have the space, we have the staff, right? Mm. We definitely have um, enough forage for those animals because again, they're very low maintenance, right? And so now we're giving real consideration to expanding to also having lamb as a commercial enterprise at the farm, sure. which is a happy surprise. Right? No, I didn't see it coming, seriously. I didn't see it. I mean, apart from the fact that I like the, the, the actual meat itself, it's a great opportunity both for the region to hopefully inspire some of our neighbors yeah, true. to actually take this up as a viable commercial enterprise as well. Mm -hmm. So now, what do you think about that? I think I'm super excited about it. After I've been doing more research about it, because <laughs> I never really thought about, you know, that ship. Uh -huh. Because growing up, there's a way we have, yes, I know in the butchers, they mix the goat with the sheep. <laughs> yeah, that is the truth. That's true. <laughs> it is so true. Like if you go to a butcher in Uganda, you never know whether you're eating lamb or you're eating the goat meat because they're almost similar in the test, I think. And the test is quite different. It's different. I've tested, it's, different. Yeah, it's different. But you know, because we have a stereotype here, like, like people really think about the pigs, they can't rear them but they love the meat. Mm -hmm. So we look at the sheep as if they're dirty, as if they're, you know, mm -hmm. they're not nice animals to eat mm -hmm. here, the yeah. stereotype we have here in Uganda. Yeah. But now after doing some more research about it, I feel I'm super excited with what is really coming along. Which is great. Which so, is really so great. guys, if you like that idea, maybe we're crazy, but that's again, that's what the, you guys think about it. Do you no, think? that's the beauty of integrated farming, right? Yeah. Because now we're not stopping anything else that we're doing. This is another Addition. option on the menu yes. that we're going to test it modestly, study it, study it see how it does. And if it makes sense, then 
we keep adding and we but move I think forward. They should also advise us how we can take on the project here as well. Yeah. In case they have any suggestions for us to do the ship thing. Types of sheep we should be wearing. Exactly. The ones that are most disease resistant. Should we do standard sheep that need to be sheared or should we do hair sheep? So we're still researching. We're still researching and seeing which type of grass is good for them as well. Absolutely. You know? But the best thing is you guys will be here for the journey. Yes. We will learn together. Yes, we because, when, together with you guys. because when it comes to this sector, we are truly beginners, just like some of you might be. Yeah. So don't be intimidated by the project. In fact, you guys should join us as we embark in the new chapter here at Value Farm, yeah. right? Because at the end of the day, the best thing you could do, I remember my days in banking mm. and the one my thing my, my director used to tell us all the time, yeah. as a manager or as a regional manager, each one, teach one. Mm. What does that mean? The best way you can help move your movement forward is to get somebody else mm. and help duplicate yourself. Wow. Meaning your knowledge, yeah, what you, you know, how to approach whatever it is that you're doing with absolute precision, mm. being the, the best at what you do professionally, is to teach somebody else. Yeah. And that's the reason why we want to share this journey with you guys, show you what we do, how we do it. Sure. We will make mistakes, we're going to learn from it, and we'll get better together. Exactly. And I'm actually excited about that. I'm excited too. Let's talk about like what we are going to look at right now because because of the grass we have for the goats here. Okay. Because we are going to look at the grasses that we researched on, like the alfalfa. We talked about the Mombasa grass that we are trying to plant for the for the goats as well. Mm -hmm. Remember, we have different breeds of goats that are the farm. That is another thing. That is another thing of integrated farming. Do not look at one breed of an item mm -hmm. or animal that you have at the farm. Yeah. So at the farm, we have the savannas, we have the boars, we have the alpine, we have the East African, or locally called the Movende. Yeah. Yes. So having them all together, of course, these are now, these are like free range. Are they also called free range? Yeah, we don't do zero grazing yeah, here. It free so range. it's free range. But that's another thing too, by the way. Now, which is better is based on what you have, what right? You have. Whether you have an acre, then you're going to have to go with zero grazing. zero grazing. But if you have forage and you have the space, mm -hmm. then free range might be a better option for you. But guys, here's what it comes down to, right? When it comes to choosing, we might love boas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> boas, Kalahari Reds, you know, those Savannah. are some of the sexy breeds, savannas. Mm -hmm. But you, where you located, mm -hmm. you have to do your research. Yes. Because though you might want to rear boas, if you somewhere where no one can afford to pay boar prices, then you might be in the wrong business if you want to be a breeder. However, you should still invest in the best genetics, right? Yes. You might not want to be a breeder per se, mm. but you might want to have the best genetics so that your goats can grow faster mm. and get to market quicker yes. because that's how you make money, mm. right? Yes. That's what it comes down to. So be smart about how you choose, research, yes. visit as many farms as possible, ask as many questions as possible. And then when you think you're ready, start. research some more. Start <laughs> but in the process, <laughs> you should start slowly, Yeah. right? Then, start small yes. and then gradually work your way to the next level. Exactly, but also have a bigger vision. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Then what about like if you're to advise on the profit profitability of a mixed farm? What do you have to say about it? That's a great question. So think of it from this standpoint. If you're growing tomato, right? In Uganda here we have wet season, right? We have the rainy season yeah. and we have what they call the dry, dry season. season. But I gotta be honest with you guys, Uganda have, there's no such thing as a dry we season. We have. I you disagree. Just not, you just don't notice it, but we have really <laughs> dry seasons, we have the, the wet season. Listen, but I- you know, the weather's has kinda changed that sometimes it rains like randomly. We let, are now lost. <laughs> Let me just tell you guys this. Uganda has rainy season and a rainier season, if that makes sense. Because what these guys consider dry, it goes from raining three to four days a week to maybe raining twice a week. <laughs> That's considered dry. So now let's just be honest about this. If you choose to embark on integrated farming, right? You need to make sure that you cover not just your bet in terms of having 
option two, three, in case option one fail. Yes. You also need to be proactive about making sure that no one ever planned for any accidents. No one ever planned for any losses. The best way to make sure you don't have to, you're not gonna be crying over catastrophic losses is to spread that risk around. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Well, know your region. You know, so you spread it around by not just putting all your eggs in one basket. And the way you do that, if you wanna just grow crops, mm -hmm. if you don't want the responsibility of always feeding animals and dealing with livestock, mm -hmm. if you want to just get into that, you can grow your tomatoes, you can have your coffee, you can have your sugar cane, yes. whatever makes sense in your region, whatever the soil can support. Where we are, though we have a fully integrated farm here, yeah. well, that's the goal for us, right? Yeah. We're in the pineapple region, yeah. where in this Lurero. area, in Lurero, where we grow like most of the pineapple yeah, here pineapple in central comes Uganda, from. it comes from here. Yeah. Now, we have not yet ventured into that. We have not. Right? But that's something in the back of our mind that we might have to consider yeah. based on our soil type. Yes. And that's the beauty of actually spreading those hedge, like hedging your losses or potential losses yes. to make sure that you don't feel catastrophic loss. So put it this way. Imagine, if you will, we were just rearing pineapples, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever disease attacked the pineapples for that season, if that's all you have, and all your pineapples or cassava, or you, you pick the crop, right? Yes. Ends up getting infected. That's your school fees for the year. You can't feed your family. You can't. You can't pay your bills. Mm. And for those of you who like to drive those fancy cars, mm. you can't keep that car if you have a loan from the bank, yes. <laughs> right? Mm. So you always want to cover all angles because the worst can happen at any time. Mm. If you lose your pineapples, you might have your strawberry fields out already. Yeah. You might have your sweet potatoes or um, whether you decide to grow sweet peppers or whatever other herbs and spices, onions, you call, you name it. So having options, Go for I'm gonna give you a good quote here. Okay. I don't remember who, where this quote came from, but life is all about options, right? Mm -hmm. The more options you, you give yourself, chances are the better your life is gonna turn out to be, right? You never wanna just put everything, all your chips, this is not Vegas, this is real life. Yeah, yeah. You don't wanna give your family's future by putting it all on the table. Now, yeah. even with cattle, we all remember what happened with the mad cow disease back in the 90s, yeah. how entire families and legacies were just ruined. So that's the reason why for me and my family and my team, this team here, we decided to go integrated because we wanted to make sure if the worst, ha worst happened in one sector, mm. we had other options on the, other table. Options the table. Guys, look at this other section here. We have street potatoes because we are trying to also put things together like cutting costs in feeds, food for the staff. Then of course, at the other side, you see the maize that is already almost getting harvest time we are going to harvest and of course this is also cutting costs for the pigs because we have the piggery section running already so we are trying to put everything to be grown at the farm so we are not only focusing on the animals but also planting stuff food stuffs for the, for for the staff now the reason we actually wanted to also highlight this with you guys this is a very small section yeah. This was a pilot program, right? We, we wanted to see whether or not the soil type can actually support this type of crop. And obviously, based on the results, it seems like that's going to be a, a, a positive result here. Yeah, true. So the next time we plant, we going to be we're going to expand on a much larger scale. Now, speaking of cost saving, for those of you who, whether you're small scale or micro, mm -hmm. at some point, you're going to have staff, right? At least that's the goal. Yeah. And so at this farm, we've been very blessed to now have 15 full-time employees that are actually working and living at the farm. And we also have a few day laborers that come here to help us, um, like, you know, stump removal, charcoal creation, um, even weeding. By the way, guys, we have charcoal. We are, we are burning from here. <laughs> because, you know, we are trying to clear most of the land. So the sticks that we have at the farm, we are making charcoal, which is going to also help like for cooking, for the staff. Yes. Yes. But actually, for again, this is something I wanted to actually highlight for you guys, right? Why is this charcoal actually important, right? Yeah. 
So put it this way, these stumps, when they removed, that's what actually gets burnt and turned into the charcoal. And, the charcoal. and it actually ends up saving us so from having to- in the US. Actually, yeah. Some of the best burgers are made using charcoal. Okay. Of course, Kingsford, if you're watching, we're here. Of course we use charcoal. Because <laughs> that's what we use for cooking here. No, we use charcoal in the US. We also use wood chips if you want to have the best barbecue. Okay. Yeah, so yes, absolutely. Charcoal is heavily used almost everywhere. Okay. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of charcoal, but in this instance, we're not actively cutting trees that, you know, just for the sake of making charcoal. No, no, no. It's a byproduct of what of actual need yes. for this farm. So, it, you know, killing two birds with one stone. True. And it's been working wonders for us so far. That is so true. And of course, the wood couldn't go to waste because we needed it. And, uh, and it's actually the stumps. Yeah, the stumps. <laughs> the, the root system that's actually being utilized to make the charcoal. The other side, this is where the charcoal was burnt. Yeah, that is the charcoal we've already harvested. Is it harvesting? Is it or do they? Well, even... I think it's been actually created. Created. <laughs> and now it's actually been packaged yeah, for storage for here storage. at the farm for so utilization. Forty thousand. Like fifty thousand. Yeah. To sixty thousand. I'll convert for you to USD so that you can see. So this is just wood from you know, from clearing the land because we needed to also utilize it as well, which is really good. Don't go away. Let me get this. It's actually not just wood, Tina. You have to get this right. These are the roots. This is actually from the ground. Yeah. So we're not cutting trees. So guys, if you think about it, right? When we dig the root system, to get rid of some of these invasive um, trees, mm. right? That make it impossible to move around the farm. True. This is part of the root system that gets uprooted and then converted into charcoal. So we're not actively just cutting down the trees, mm. but it's part of us clearing the land so we can actually have access to utilize the land to its full potential. Yeah, true. And we also leave some trees on the ground. Lots, Lots of trees. Not only. But the good thing is, for every tree we remove from the farm, we do plan on planting thousands, thousands. more. We are thousands of eucalyptus, yeah. introducing pine. bamboo, pine. So we're definitely taking the eco approach to what yeah, we're trying to do here. True. So yeah. we are trying to improve on the plants that we have here as well. So these ones that are not useful, we are going to utilize as well. But we're not destroying the environment. No, we're very mindful of that. Yeah. This other section, we have the, um, the, the passion, passion fruit. fruits. Yes, We've okay. tested it. Yeah, tested it. It's doing well. Our colleagues are weeding a little bit. Then this other side here. Is the alfalfa. We have the alfalfa. That was the test we did. Yes. And I think I've ever showed you guys how the alfalfa is before. So this is just like an update. The nets, then the this. Yeah, they're requesting the nets to make sure we provide additional shades, mm -hmm. and actually we've already ordered that, so we'll have that here, hopefully within the next week or so. Okay. So, the best. So this is the alfalfa, guys. Just amazing. That was just the first one. So this. The first test. We've we've since test. added more, and we're gonna keep adding and just keep testing to okay. see what makes sense here. So guys, I know we're a bit far from the shot, but we wanted to actually get you guys a good view from up here. So we'll ask our very, very, very intelligent camera guy to come this way. Yes. So he can stand on this side, right? So you guys can actually get a better view, a better vintage side here. You stand over here, my friend, please. Give the audience an opportunity to see. So initially what we did, when this area is, also, is still in the process of being cleared. And, um, but as you guys can see, a lot of these roots system, the stumps need to be removed still. But we're testing this area here with the soil here to test out whether or not we can grow cabbage here. Mm. We can grow carrots, carrots here. 
we can grow potentially tomatoes here, right? And this is how we do it. Very small sample size to see what will germinate, how well it does. And then if it works out the way we're hoping it does, the rest of this valley is going to be cleared and prepared for the next season for us to plant much more of whichever variety actually perform well with this soil type. So that's actually the basis of what we do as an integrated farming team, right? Because we're constantly testing to see what works, what doesn't work. And again, this is the microcosm of what we believe here at Value Farm. You know, you start small and you work your way to the next level, think right? Big. You think big, but you start small, yes. but with the eye for the absolute highest height you can reach. True. But then the best thing you can do, you don't just jump out of the plane without a parachute. Actually, that's the best way to think about integrated farming. Okay, okay. You jump with that's a parachute, nice right? Because ultimately, you know, if option A doesn't work, you want to have option B on option standby. B. That's pretty much and it. And by the way, guys, this whole place here was a whole bush. <laughs> like people were it was being forest. dust on this journey. You know how it has been like the time we were hunting for this land, how we were moving to the bushes, surveying, thorns and all that. This whole place was a bush. But if you see right now, our colleagues have really cleared the land. We are testing, we are trying at least to utilize the resources that we have at the farm. Definitely. And of course, to a farmer out there, someone who is starting, or is, who is thinking of starting a farm, especially an integrated one, don't lose hope. Huh? Keep trying. Even if things are not working out, at least because there are some projects, maybe because depending like how we say, depending on your location, your geographical location may not support what we have here, try something else because this is all integrated we are trying this and that so there's a lot that you can learn from us it may not be piggery it can be also what we are trying to plant and put on ground because if it really works so well here we shall go commercial we shall not only plant for only our staff but also sell out to you guys when you come here or in case you want to come here at the farm to learn you will get to learn from what we have at the farm so never lose hope just do what you're supposed to do and also another thing that I wanted also to tell farmers, a piece of advice to not only farmers, to the youth out there. With all the circumstances we've gone through because of COVID, most of us have been laid off our jobs or restructuring. So most of us have really, you know, left with nothing. But of course our dreams like as, as students, but like after school, you dream of having a white collar job. You want to sit in an office, air conditioned. But sometimes circumstances force you out of that environment, you don't have nothing to do. So there are other options that you can do as well. Like farming, farming is not a dirty, dirty kind of business that you can do, because most people consider it as a dirty kind of business because you're in the bushes, you're in the soil, you're in the hot sun. But at the end of it, all people are ripping so big from being in the bushes. If you have your goats there, you're, you're, you're grazing it in the grasses. At the end of it all, you can even earn better than a person who sits in an office 24-7. Receiving a salary and someone who has lots of cattle, lots of sheep, lots of goats, lots of pigs, can earn even bigger than a person who gets a, a fixed salary. Because even there's even an estimated kind of salary, like if you're working in, yeah. in, a, in an office. Yeah. So in case you have something like this, you have financial freedom. You don't have someone who is going to push. You're the one to push yourself to work. So my youth out there, I would really encourage you. I want to inspire you so that you can do something that is really available. Do not just look down at, at some jobs because you feel like it is too small for you. Wow. Yes, that's what I would really say. I don't know what else I can add to that. That is excellent advice. I mean, this is the reason why I wanted to be a part of this team, right? Mm -hmm. Many of you out there might think, like, oh my God, this guy's coming here. No, mm -hmm. this was the calling. Because when you find someone with this mindset, this is not something I had to impart on my partner here. This is just who she is, right? Um, what I can share, if I can even dovetail based on what you just mentioned, mm. farming is not just for the youth, it's not just for the old, it's yeah. for everybody. everybody. Because if, if you have the desire, if you have the will, if you're okay with getting your hands dirty, you know, listen, I'm from the corporate world, as I mentioned to you guys before, mm. but I always felt like a fish out of water mm -hmm. in that world. I'm so much more comfortable 
buying goats, being with my goats, being here with the pigs, just making sure that they're doing well, they're being fed on time, you know, walking the property, making sure that everything is being done to the standard mm. that we as an organization want to set for Value Farm. And you guys out there that actually follow us on this journey, you know, I don't have 40 years of farming experience, okay? But what I do have is loads and loads of passion and a true desire to try to do the best I can in this field, true. you know? And the best thing about being here, it's one thing to put something in the ground mm -hmm. to see it come up. Mm -hmm. It's also something to start a farm like this in the bush to actually see it come to life. Exactly. It is the most incredible, most rewarding experience oh gosh, I've yes. ever embarked exactly. on. So I will, all I can tell you guys, you know, whether you're in a cubicle right now watching, you know, without your bosses finding out, <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. Or whether you're at home with your baby, you know, tucking him or her in, you're watching this video, just know there's a place for you in farming. Yeah. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Whether you have a master's degree, college degree, or you only finished a P7 or wherever you got, mm -hmm. farming does not discriminate. The only thing we recognize is hard work. Exactly and dedication and you will definitely reap what you sow so yes. thank you guys for joining us here at value farm we look forward Another to seeing you guys again also add, like for someone to get out of their comfort zone like you said mm -hmm. if you're in a cubicle watching this video do not just watch mm -hmm. do something yeah yes you don't have to just be there watch keep watching us progressing from one step to the other and you're just thinking like how am i going to begin this like we always say start small but think big get out of that comfort zone then another thing that i also wanted to put across from what comments that we received from you there's a person who said like we are, we have bigger structures we're investing more on the structures than the animals that we have at the farm that doesn't make sense but it's it makes sense at the end of it all what you have to know is we are really investing on the bigger structures or permanent structures it's for a long-term purpose of course it depends on the finances that you have at the beginning we started small by the way that's what you keep forgetting very humble beginnings yes we started very small but we are just keeping on growing so the animals that we have right now like we always say you don't have to stock so many animals in the beginning start with what you can manage learn from that then you keep expanding so right now our goal is to expand because we've seen at least for the month that we've reared the goats the months we've reared the pigs we know we can handle that's absolutely what I'm Yes. Yeah, and again, that's a great point. By the way, guys, what, like any other business, you can't just jump in with both feet without having a plan, right? Yeah. And I remember initially, even the goat house we decided to build, initially, we never thought we would ever get to the point of having 500 to 1,000 goats, yeah. right? So, but the most important lesson I learned from my friend Hamisi, mm. shout outs to that's you, <laughs> is the fact that based on our additional research, if you plan on having at least 100 to 150 goats, you don't build a goat house for 150 goats. Mm -hmm. You build a house for three to 400 goats because yeah. ultimately your 100 goat is going to get to that point. Yes. The last thing you want to do when you have about 50 goats pregnant, trying to, trying to build and you know, be racing against the clock from when your goats are about to deliver mm -hmm. and you don't have a place to put, to put them. So yeah, we did emphasize on structure on permanent structures because there's, there's a quote I want to make sure I share with you guys. It's a very simple one and I think most of you will get it. Mm. Cheap sometimes is the most expensive item on the menu. It is so true. Because for those of you who think, oh my God, just build any old structure. Mm -hmm. But what's the price when your goats are dying because they're not properly elevated off the floor? That costs mm. you even more money. Yeah. So you taking the time, you saving whatever you have to actually build something to standard, to standard. if you're able to. We're not telling you have to spend a billion shillings. No, no. You start with what you yeah, have and then you improve along the way because that's what we did. Because that's initially in the beginning, we didn't even have adequate housing Nothing. for our pigs, <laughs> for yes. the piglets. We literally had tents. With nothing, no water system with nothing. But you know what? On, on the basins and it was just a you know, but it, it was still a start. Mm. In fact, those same piglets we had then is the I reward. <laughs> Here, you guys are seeing and those are the piglets the pigs that are not giving us all of our piglets that's our parenting stock mm. 
and now we actually have a vast number of pigs at the farm. Yeah. But we started with what, just like 15 or 20, 15, 15, 15 young female piglets. And we had a tent and we had a very small corral. We had <laughs> nothing that we had now. Mm. So it, it goes to show you, you know, the approach is true. You can yeah. definitely start small. You think big, you have a plan, a and you plan. execute on a plan. Mm. And here's the last thing I'll leave you guys with. There's another saying, and I know I shared this a lot, but these are the things these, that actually help guide me in my profession. Yes. You know, when it comes to, you know, success has a lot of fathers, a lot of mothers. Failures are always often, mm. often. Nobody wants to claim a failure. But if you're a success, everybody want to be around that circle. Yeah, right. So, true. so when it comes to this, you're going to have naysayers in your family. You're going to have naysayers at work. You're going to leave this job to go start farming. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in yourself, in yourself and believe in the process. Because at the end of the day, a lot of my friends, a lot of my colleagues back home, when I told them I was leaving my <laughs> corporate gig to come. to come to Uganda, Africa, they all thought I was crazy. Sure. I guess I am crazy, crazy like a fox because I'm here. I think that is a sub to me as I, well. I'm living my best <laughs> life here in Uganda. I love the people. I love the community. It's been a wonderful experience. Mm. And I got to tell you guys, no matter where you are, you follow your heart. Sure. You plan, follow your heart, and you execute. And everybody who looks at you as if you're crazy, when you're reaping from your hard work, mm. they're going to look back and they're going to be the ones with the stupid... Um, with the silly smile and the silly grin on their face when you first starting, you, yeah. those are the people that are like, wow, I knew she was gonna make it. I knew he was gonna make it. Yes, they were the ones who were talking so <laughs> The naysayers, far. right? Yes. So that's all I have for you guys on my part. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful day here at the farm. Yeah. And um, I hope to catch you guys soon in another video. I don't do this very often. Yeah, but we are really so grateful to have you here <laughs> on the platform because you guys requested. By the way, people said I should do a Q&A with you. Of course, they have a few questions that we shall maybe do in a different video so that you can be able to answer about investment, yeah, about moving. That's there. fine. If yeah. you guys want to see that, I'll be more than happy to share whatever knowledge, whatever my experience has been. Yeah. I can tell you, I think I would love to actually share that with you guys also because yeah. what I've encountered, I think might actually be of some use. Mm. Um, some of the things that you guys can learn from. So yeah, I'll be yeah, open that to is that. amazing, but we are yeah. glad to have you on the platform and also inspire other farmers there, the young, the old, you know, people who want to start immediately. We really appreciate for your kind words and also advice because it's really amazing to also have you as the director of the farm as well. Yeah, as one of the directors one of, of the, the farm. <laughs> guys, let me, let me make sure that you guys one understand this. One of the directors this. of the farm, so. Mm -hmm. So, Here's, 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 here's an inside scoop for you guys, right? You know her as Tina, <laughs> but amongst the team, she's known as the maestro, the orchestrator, right? Because like the how she earned that nickname amongst all of us behind the scene is because with this kind of partner, anything we need to have done, anything that I didn't know how to do or how to find, there was always a help Tina button there, right? So that's how she got the maestro's nickname <laughs> because at the end of the day, she's the actual rainmaker. Yes, I'm here for support. Yes, I bring a different skill set to the table, but together as a group, she makes everything work. So at the end of the day, I'm very grateful to have you as a partner. Thank you. We're very grateful for you guys out there watching mm -hmm. and all the fans that are out there waiting to see what's next for Value Farm. Yeah. Subscribe, stay tuned, and we'll take you on the journey. See yeah. you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.